Hello everyone, uh, Sterling White here. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you haven't already and you're on the YouTube, hit that subscribe button so you can be informed on the content moving forward where I drop absolute fire. And it's a little bit cold out here in Louisville, Kentucky. I like to pronounce it Louisville, but it's actually Louisville. That's why I have my hat on right now. But we'll be going into the five mistakes you want to avoid when dealing with sellers. Now tune in. All right, and the first one is focusing too much efforts on a seller who is not actually a seller. And this goes down to one of my favorite principles, which is the 80-20. It's Parcelist Law or Pareto's Law, uh, where just in dealing in the, the real estate space or when you're acquiring deals is uh, honing in 80% of your time on the 20% that will actually give you the results. That's just an example and you can go either way when you think of the leveraging that specific principle. But meaning is uh, the 80% that you wanna focus on are someone who is just my general criteria, property is distressed, the uh, owner is actually motivated to sell it, whether they just inherited it, they've just recently relocated and they're tired of managing or uh, other instances of that nature or they need the cash to uh, be able to pay some unforeseen expense that they have. And then the next one is that they there is a timeline to sell, whether it's now or within the next couple of months. So uh, those are those. The second is following up with the same pitch because this is one of my absolute game changers for myself is to always uh, follow up. That is where the money is made. And when you are following up, if you're just constantly using the same, same message in your call saying, now you're interested in selling, now you're interested, now you're interested in selling, you will easily be put on the block list and that person will not wanna speak to you again. So if you're able to be creative with the ways that you follow up, uh, that goes that much further. So I'll just give you some examples myself. The first one being is when following up with an owner, many of you have heard, I love using the Rubik's Cube. Send a Rubik's Cube, uh, a small itty bitty one with a note that says, hey, let's figure this out. Another one that I've uh, recently been implementing as a follow-up is to send birthday cards. Yes, birthday cards on days that it may not even be their exact birthday, but this is just another way to creatively follow up. And then another, uh, another method is being value-based, saying to the uh, seller is, have you considered a 1031 exchange? Which is just a way to defer taxes, but that's just a way to stay top of mind because it comes down to timing when someone may not be interested now, but anything can change. And if you're at the forefront of their mind, then you're gonna be their go-to contact. So there's uh, the, we'll jump into the next one, which is, not letting the seller talk. This by far is beneficial to you is sometimes uh, sellers like to go on a little bit of rambles, but generally people love to hear themselves talk. So if you're constantly cutting them off, uh, that is not allowing you to build that rapport. And then also when someone tends to go on rambles, you're able to get more details about the property that maybe you can leverage at a later point in negotiations, or you just really want, to, it comes down to is determining if that person on the other end has a problem to be solved. Uh, if there is no problem, then there's really not a solution for you uh, to really solve that and then to move on to the, uh, the next individual that uh, there is a problem for you to solve to where you can focus your time and be able to get a great deal. So the fourth is, and I've got a little uh, notes that I'm looking over here, so that's why I'm switching just a tad bit. <laughs> uh, the next one is making it all about price. So if the person knows it's that that is all that you're in for of course you want to get a good deal on it but just making it all about price the other person on the other end will sense that and you're not able to build that rapport so if you're having conversations about the property and understanding if there is a problem to be solved and you're constantly hitting on okay what is the price that uh, you would want to sell it for and then you go back to okay what's the price that you'll want to sell it for then they will end up going with someone uh, else because a lot of times it's not really about price. This property that I'm at now is 
I was not the highest bidder in terms of the actual uh, offer that I provided, but I was able to build that rapport and that relationship with the owner and then was able to get the upper hand over all the other uh, bidders that were in place. Actually, there were no other bidders just due to building that relationship, cut all the other ones out, even though they had higher offers. And the last but not least is having a small pipeline. This is for you, the person who is looking at this video. Small pipeline means is that you don't have enough leads or uh, owners, uh, sellers that you're prospecting. So you're uh, just focusing too much time on ones that will not give you the most results. Maybe you fell in love with one property and that seller's not a seller. Uh, and then it seems desperate when you're uh, trying to do your negotiations and buy that property versus if you have a large enough pipeline, then that allows you to just move on to the next one. So thanks everyone for tuning in. Those are the five mistakes that you want to avoid. And myself is I still make mistakes to this day and I'm still learning myself. And that's why I generally just love sharing my experiences as an entrepreneur investor uh, in my journey. Uh, in this industry. So thanks so much. I'll see you on the next one.